God has descended upon Mount Sinai and the people fear. But Moses comes before God to receive the instructions of the Sinai Covenant on The Bible Brief. Today is review day on The Bible Brief. If you haven't left us a five-star review on your podcast platform, will you do that today? Reviews are a key way that new people find out about the show. Where are you? I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. From Genesis, chapter 3. Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, they died spiritually, before eventually suffering physical death as well. They broke God's one prohibition in the garden. And immediately, something happened. Something critical for us to remember. This is from Genesis 3, verses 7 through 11. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. These words have incredible depth an insight for us as we continue in the Bible story. Shameful nakedness in the presence of God leads to fear of Him. And not only that, but there's something that this first couple understood about themselves that led them to create barriers between their shameful nakedness and God's presence. They made fig leaf loincloths and they hid themselves. Two layers of separation. But why? Why hide and separate themselves from God? Why prove out their own sinfulness with the very actions of clothing themselves and hiding themselves? Well, the answer to that is fear. This fear is something that the Israelites tasted there at the foot of Mount Sinai. God had descended in a magnificent and foreboding manner with thundering, lightning, smoking, and fire not to mention the loud trumpet emanating its sound out of the billowing cloud of smoke. Remember the people said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses then responds saying, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of Him may be before you, that you may not sin. Isn't that an odd statement from Moses? In one breath he says, Do not fear, And in the next breath, he says that the fear of God is actually intended to be before the people so that they may not sin. In some ways, he says, you're fearing God wrongly. The fear of God isn't to push you away from him. The fear is to motivate your own purity. And then as if to prove his point, Moses approaches this dark, tumultuous cloud where God is, while the people stand far off. And then to begin a significant section of the Bible, elaborating and expanding upon the Ten Commandments, God begins to give instructions for how to worship Him to Moses that He is to communicate to the people. Notice here that this method of worship looks a lot like how Abraham and others earlier in the Bible worshipped God. We read this in Exodus 20, starting in verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the people of Israel, You have seen for yourselves that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver to be with me, nor shall you make for yourselves gods of gold. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. If you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it of hewn stones, for if you wield your tool on it, you profane it. And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. 
Do you remember how Abraham seemingly made altars everywhere he went in the land of Canaan? He was honoring the one true God with his simple worship of building these mounds for memory, for sacrifice, and for worship. And the first commands that God gives the nation after the Ten Commandments are commandments for the simple worship in the same manner as their forefathers. Memorials of God's actions are be to made with small mounds, not even tall enough to require steps to go up to the altar. And that's for a reason related to the very beginning. God says you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Notice here that God is providing a command that helps the people stay away from exposing their shameful nakedness. His regulations for worship are to help the people live a life that honors God despite their sinful condition. His commands are, in a way, providing legal coverings that allow one to approach this fearful God in an appropriate worshipful way. They are to promote a life of holiness, set-apartness, and worship in His chosen nation. This nation of Israel, chosen to be a nation to serve as priests, as go-betweens, for all the nations of the world. To live separate and holy lives, showing God to the nations outside of Israel. As Moses said, the fear of the Lord should lead to a less sinful life, as the nation of Israel follows the commands of God. But these commands aren't merely commands. Remember they're part of another covenant that God is making in history. This covenant is called the Sinai Covenant, and its laws and instructions are included in the vast section of the Bible between Exodus chapter 19 all the way through the end of the book of Deuteronomy. We're not going to go through all these commands, but we will summarize several of the important aspects of this Sinai Covenant as we continue through the narrative. Because in the midst of these laws being expressed, there's also a story that informs and elicits the laws as they're given by God through Moses. As we move through the Sinai Covenant narrative, keep in mind that there are expressions of laws and teachings that we simply won't have time to address in this narrative walkthrough of the Bible. Okay, so after these initial instructions about the simple worship of God that the people can do with memorial altars, God then tells Moses many more regulatory practices for the nation. First, he gives regulations regarding slavery which in the ancient world most commonly involved contractually committing oneself to another's service until a debt to them was paid off. Essentially, instead of paying back a debt with money, you would pay it back with exclusive labor to the party that you owed payment to. As you can imagine, this practice was ripe for abuse, and God put regulations on the practice to ensure that Israel maintained the essential humanity of the slave even if that person's labor was owned by another. Next, God gives regulations around restitution. That is, what should happen when another person wrongs someone in Israel? What about temporary injury? What about unintended killing? There are lots of questions like these that God answers. But within these regulations, a principle pops up that you may recognize. And it expresses the essential justice principle in the Bible. It's the justice principle of this. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. From Exodus 21, 25. The principle can be expressed in this way. Ideal justice requires instant and equivalent restitution for the wrong done. That is, the punishment should fit the crime committed, with no room for vengeful overpunishing. There are more laws in the intervening text, but we're going to focus on one more before we move on in the narrative. In addition to the Sabbath day of rest that was to occur on the seventh day of the week, God also commands here that the land of Israel should have a Sabbath rest every seventh year. So not only was Israel to rest from labor weekly, their land was also to rest every seven years. These commands regarding the Sabbath are no small thing to God especially because the Sabbath itself becomes the main sign for this covenant at Sinai that God's making with Israel. Remember, the sign of the Noahic covenant was the rainbow. The sign of the Abrahamic covenant was circumcision. And here, the sign of the Sinai covenant is the Sabbath. Now don't forget this, 
because this sign will become a bit of an issue for the people of Israel in years to come. Remember, Sabbath rest on the seventh day, Sabbath rest on the seventh year. Okay, so after three solid chapters of regulations that you should read yourself, the covenant becomes official, and it becomes official in a ceremony that occurs at Mount Sinai. Let's read beginning in Exodus chapter 24, verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant that he had written and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Notice at this point that the people have agreed to obedience to God three times. Once in chapter 19 and twice here in chapter 24. They've committed themselves to obedience to this Sinai covenant. And then Moses here seals it with blood, just as blood has been involved in each covenant so far. The formal covenant has been made and the Sinai covenant has been officially established. But soon, after a scene where the elders of Israel eat a covenant meal with God up on the mountain, we see God again calling Moses to the top of the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone, with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it. And on the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. The Sinai covenant has been made. The people have committed themselves to following the statutes and regulations given by God. And God has promised that in return for their obedience, They will be his treasured possession among all the nations, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, a wonderful covenant for a people saved by God from their Egyptian slavery. But there was a problem. Remember the grumbling about the bitter water? Remember the grumbling about the meat and the bread? Remember the test of the Lord at Meribah and the water from the rock? Remember that these people seem to forget all that God has done for them just about as soon as he's done it? Well, let's just say that 40 days and 40 nights was a long time to wait for Moses up on that mountain because a lot can happen in 40 days. Join us next time as Moses comes down the mountain and finds something grotesque. Israel has gone wild and Aaron is to blame. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023